This is my first time speaking at Lisa. Uh, I'm ex excited to be here. Um, got to see a lot of uh, new faces and a lot of folks I've worked with over the years, so it's great uh, to get to be back. Um, I've got a background in operations as a sysadmin. Uh, started with Unix Linux systems like 15 years ago. I used to live here in Seattle, worked down the street at a place called Speakeasy. Uh, started using Puppet there. Yeah, some fans. Uh, uh, in 2008, uh, I, I do my own Puppet training and consulting now uh, at learnpuppet.com, including a two-day RSpec Puppet course. Um, how many folks in here today are using uh, Puppet? Holy shit. Oh, wow. Um, how about Chef? How about uh, something else? Rsync, Tarballs, Sedoc, yeah. Golden Images, uh, Docker containers or VMs that they didn't build and have no idea what's inside of them. Come on, yeah, yeah. Um, right on. Well, I'm also, up here I'm also gonna give a quick plug for FossetCon, it's a brand new conference. We just had our first year, I'm a organizer at it. Uh, so check us out on Twitter. We're gonna have the dates announced and CFP open soon. Um, so uh, TDD stands for Test Driven Development. Um, the way TDD works is you write tests, they fail, uh, you write code and just enough code to make the test pass and then you refactor your code um, and repeat as necessary. Does anyone in here uh, do any sort of test-driven development now? Does anyone in here uh, write their code first and then they write the tests? Does anyone in here just write the code and go on with their day and like screw the tests? Yeah, that's like most of us, right? Yeah. So uh, wh why test? Um, who's ever had an architecture that looks like this? Um, whether you built it or not, I won't ask you to raise your hand for that, but you worked at a place and the architecture could be summarized like that, yeah? Um, tons of code, no one truly knows how it works, what all the individual components are, uh, how they uh, speak to each other. Um, I worked uh, with a uh, colleague here, Eric, and uh, he had to write a program to visualize TCP dumps just so we could see what things were speaking to each other, because we had like no idea how any of it talked to each other. Is anyone in that boat? Yeah? No one? Yeah, your architectures are all like super awesome, don't look like this? I don't believe you. Yeah. Um, who here ever feels like Fry before doing a deploy or making a change? Yeah? You're just like, I hope this works. I kind of want to go out uh, after work, and like I've got you know a life and things to do. Let's 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 hope uh, this doesn't mean I'm spending my weekend back at work, right? Um, do you have the confidence to make like big changes? Um, often uh, b b we won't improve or correct a process because we don't know how it works. Uh, but 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 even more so, we don't know how it should work, right? We just know. Uh, if you feed some data in here, you know, things get updated over there, kinda, and I don't know if it also has, touches these other systems over there, so let's just, like, uh, not touch anything at all uh, and lead to paralysis because it works good enough today, right? Am I the only one that that ever happens to? Yeah? Do you have code at work or, like, uh, or different processes and you're just, like, don't look at it directly uh, or you'll go blind? Yeah. Uh, like, figure since we were back in Seattle, I'd get this guy on the screen. Um, raise your hand if you identify as a developer. All right, so some a, a few brave souls uh, at this conference, and who would identify themselves as a sysadmin? I like everybody else. Um, who raised their hand for both? All right, yeah. Um, so, uh, like, developers use version control for branching and merging, not just for contributing your scripts to, like I did with SVN for years, who's doing that, right? You just like commit your script in, good, but there's never any, I'm gonna merge it with somebody else. 
Um, developers also write tests. Uh, they often have automated platforms for running those tests. Um, who here uh, is into DevOps and has, you know, rubbed some DevOps on it? Um, who, who here has DevOps in their title? Uh, come on. Who here is hiring at their company and there's DevOps in the title? Yeah. I know there's some hands going up. I've seen the job board. Um, so with DevOps, uh, we are all sort of developers now. Um, and us ops folks have a lot to learn from developers. Um, who here has ever heard the term infrastructure as code? Yeah, awesome. Uh, so almost everyone raised their hand that they heard of infrastructure as code, but no one raised their hand that they were a developer, but you all run infrastructure as sysadmins. That's interesting. Um, so like we want to express uh, uh, our infrastructure uh, through code in our configuration management platform. Um, with infrastructure as code, we can use uh, development tooling such as diff, uh, version control, automated testing, continuous integration, uh, build pipelines for testing, deploying, and monitoring systems. Um, I'm gonna go on the soapbox since you all gave me the mic here. Um, who, who, when they uh, have uh, commits, wrote, I changed this, or this change, right? M more hands should go up, I've seen your commit logs. Um, so like diff does, this, does a really good job about telling us what changed, and a really terrible job about, about uh, why you made the change. So if you get nothing else from my talk, like TDD aside, uh, start writing why you made the change, and not what changed, um, and your colleagues would love you. Um, do you wait until uh, production to see if your change worked? Hopefully not, that probably doesn't end well. Um, if you wanna make a change, uh, how long does it take before you know that you broke something or that your change is, isn't gonna work? Weeks? Yeah, uh, days? Hours, that's better. Uh, minutes, uh, instantly because production is down. <laughs> yeah. By failing fast, we can quickly uh, make corrections. It also gives us the power to try new things. Um, so you, you'll have more confidence to you know, change that system that you don't quite understand because you'll know quickly that it failed, and hopefully by quickly, uh, that's you know before it hits production. Um, by testing proposed changes in an automated fashion, we get the fast feedback, uh, which is critical. Uh, have you ever felt like you were moving backwards and solving the same problem twice? Right, like, oh, I thought we fixed that. Why is it back? No? I know that would happen to me all the time. Uh, so regression uh, of, uh, of problems. So another reason why we test is that when we solve a problem, it stays solved and it doesn't just come back. Um, I hate solving the same thing twice. I hate more having to explain that the same reason is why we had the outage twice. Who maintains a, a uh, heterogeneous environment? Yeah, so most, most of the folks here um, even in a homogenous environment of OSs, who maintains multiple versions? Yeah? Who has to support multiple versions of the same language? Like you have different versions of like Ruby or PHP or like whatever it is, yeah. Um, so we need to test against all our supported platforms, right? This goes back to this idea of infrastructure as code. And if you uh, support all these platforms, you need to test for all of them. Um, which gets us into matrix testing. This looks like it's a little hard to read, but here I'm testing some puppet code that it works on a handful of different puppet versions as well as uh, multiple versions of Ruby. And so matrix testing becomes important uh, as you all raised your hands that your systems don't all look the same. Uh, 
Um, design specifications are another reason why we should write tests. Um, who writes long-winded design docs? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, uh, who here is all agile and they don't have to write design docs like anymore? Yeah, so like just because we took on the agile role uh, doesn't mean that we don't have design docs anymore. And so uh, in this view, uh, user stories, are folks familiar with that if you're doing agile stuff, yeah? So user stories can then be turned into tests. Um, so like you might have a user story, as a customer, I want the shopping cart to work so I can buy stuff, right? So that turns into a test that someone could put an item in the cart and they can actually buy something. Um, and so these tests uh, serve as the design specification. So instead of having to you know, write some document with a ton of design specs, um, which I always hated, like I don't even know how to use the word processor, right? So much less making it format to show all this stuff was like not fun for me. I could just write tests and that's the design specification. Does it, does it meet those tests? Um, yeah, no one reads those docs like anyways, so uh, yeah. Um, you didn't deliver what I asked for. Wait, I built what you wanted, right? Does anyone ever have this conversation? Yeah, um, so with tests as your design specs, this can help you avoid uh, this type of finger pointing. Um, so now that we covered why test, why test first? Because uh, the folks that were testing in here, uh, the majority said, you know, they, uh, you know, uh, write the write the code first and then the test, or cut and then measure. I think, but cutting is more fun than measuring. All right, who here likes to be told um, exactly what tech they should use and how to build it to solve a problem? Um, <laughs> not me, uh, uh, I think most of us here like wanna know the goal and then let us decide how to fix it. Like that's why we're the engineers in your org. Um, and with that, we wanna focus on the end goal and not the steps involved. Um, this also means that you can decouple a bit and perhaps have uh, folks that are asking for work done help help you with the tests, the acceptance tests, while it's up to you as the engineer to figure out, well, how are you gonna implement that, right? So someone says, I want the shopping cart to work so I can buy stuff, great, you don't have to tell me what tech to use. Uh, now that we've agreed on the tests, I'm gonna fulfill that. Um, by writing tests first, we put the focus on the goal, doing just enough work to make the test pass, and not on how we get there. Testing documents functionality that you care about. And so uh, if you provide a website, that's what matters. Um, which software serves the content? Not so much. Uh, if you don't believe me, like go ask your CEO on their thoughts on Nginx versus Apache. Uh, see, see how that goes for you. Anyone see an issue with that? So this is the teapot from the book, uh, The Design of, of Everyday Things, which I recommend. And so writing tests uh, first makes us think about the design so we don't end up with teapots like this. Um, by writing code before the test, you often build the wrong thing and you build too much of it. Um, who here has ever uh, heard about a project and said, here's my chance to squeeze in this new technology I learned about at the last conference, right? Like, who here is just looking for just things to like throw Docker and go at, right? Uh, yeah, um, or let's make sure it can scale to the size of Google, right? Like someone proposes a uh, engineering change, you're like, that's not web scale, right? <laughs> Who's ever said that or like heard it, yeah? Uh, yeah, so like you built this, and uh, what you really needed was this. And so writing tests first means that you can save time by building the minimum viable product or MVP. Uh, so you can focus on building the smallest, quickest thing 
that meets the actual needs of the business today. Um, yeah, that's why you're there. Um, don't try to over-optimize your solutions. Um, you can refactor later. And if there's not time to refactor later, that thing that you built's not that important, right? Um, who's worked in an org and spent so much time optimizing for problems that hadn't yet occurred that they didn't solve the problems of today? Yeah, I have. Being agile isn't just about stand-ups and post-it notes. Uh, it's about actually being able to move with the needs of the business. Now, not building uh, this, this grand architecture that nobody actually needs or will ever use. Um, so let's talk about what to test. Um, like now that we covered why test first, uh, yeah. So let's test all of the data inputs. Uh, the folks that raised their hands as developers at the beginning can likely tell you to never trust the data that someone gives you. Um, so we want to validate all of the data. Um, is it the right type? Does it match this like regex? Um, is it what we expect? And so if you're modeling infrastructure as code, you have to make sure that all of your inputs are, are, are sane. Uh, like conditional logic, we want to test uh, all outcomes whenever we use uh, conditional logic. So if you're using, you know, uh, if this is EL5 or 6 or 7, do these different things, your tests need to take that into account. So you're testing for all of those possibilities. Whenever you introduce uh, any sort of conditional logic, that's a cue that you need to have a test on both sides of that. Um, yeah, see what's going on there? So here we've got some uh, bright young men uh, with an extension cable floating on their flip-flops or uh, thongs for you uh, folks from Australia there. And what do you think is about to happen here? All right? Uh, they're probably not gonna uh, do so well. And so we, like, we wanna test that failure occurs when it's expected, such as this. So uh, if your processes are built to fail under some, under some circumstance, test that it actually fails. Um, let's say you model your infrastructure to support uh, RHEL 5, 6, and 7, and you don't know what platform you're on, you need to fail by default, and then test that that failure happens by default. Yeah. So again, don't just test what you think should happen. If things are supposed to fail, test that it actually fails. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about tooling. Um, version control software that makes branching and merging easy to do. Uh, big fan of Git. Who here like, uses Git? Almost everybody. Uh, who here uses something else? Oh, yeah, I'll, uh, oh, about half. Um, if that's, who is that something else is SVN? Brave souls, thank you. Um, so uh, if you're using SVN or something else and you want to learn about Git, um, send me an email or hit me up on Twitter or something and I'd, I'd be happy to show you tutorials and help with that and, and bring you into the rest of the, uh, with the rest of the club here. Um, yeah. Uh, who uses GitHub? Yep, right on. I'm, I'm a big fan of that service because it provides a very low barrier of entry for collaborating with others. And whether you use GitHub, you know, some proprietary software, or you use something else, uh, keep in mind that coding is social and you want a platform that promotes teamwork. Um, just because you can push your Git repo to some remote place and, you know, that's kind of what GitHub is providing for you as well, like that's not, that's not the end goal. The end goal is to work with your colleagues uh, to, to develop things. Um, so if your tools are hard to use, people are not gonna use them. Like how many folks have like went to submit like a bug or a patch or something and it was just too many steps and you're just like, screw it. Yeah, I definitely have. Um, so if, if adding tests is easy, people will add them. 
if they have to jump through a million hoops and you provide some system that's really hard to use, well, go figure, like nobody's gonna wanna use it. Um, a tool that's easy to use is travisci.org. How many folks are using Travis now? Yeah, only a couple, surprising. Um, so Travis integrates with GitHub and provides a testing framework. Uh, basically, it's free for public repos and they will spin up VMs and run all your tests and then report back to you if there's any failures. And so you could build all that yourself or you can like use it all for free. It's, it's there today and since tons of folks raise their hand for GitHub, like it's really easy to integrate that. Um, here's an example of uh, a test failing. And so I see right in the uh, log there uh, during the conversation, Travis is popping in and saying, hey, by the way, this failed. You know, prob probably don't want to merge it, right? Um, or here's an example here. Uh, you know, Travis works, or sorry, the uh, uh, tests all came back green and everything's good. So now I've got way more confidence to merge that. Um, Obviously, before I merge it, I want to make sure that they're actually submitting new spec tests for their new features, but this gives me way more confidence to press that merge button. Who here has ever just sat at the like page and like waited to press the merge button? You're like, uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so we want to stay away from that. Um, see if I can turn to a shell quickly. So here's an example of uh, Travis, the configuration for it. And so we can see it's like pretty simple. It's a YAML file. I'm giving it a few bits of information on a matrix I want to test. And then there's a uh, screen, or a uh, command that says run all these commands. They're chained together with and. And if it exits zero, then it passes. And so uh, it's not language specific. You basically just say run whatever it is you want it to run, and if it comes back zero, everything's good. And so it makes it really easy to do matrix testing no matter what your project is. Who here uses Jenkins? Who's like heard of Jenkins or like I should get some of that? Yeah. All right, so uh, with Jenkins you can build your own test pipelines. So like the functionality I was talking about with Travis, you could totally build yourself. Um, it's great to integrate with version control and, and run tests and provide feedback. Um, it helps you quickly understand if your change is like good or not, and that's what it's really all about, is you know, f figuring out uh, is my change gonna break things. Uh, who uses Vagrant? Yeah, excellent. So Vagrant, I'm a fan of. Um, it, it allows you to spin up uh, VMs from the command line, and it has multiple backends like VirtualBox, VMware, AWS. Um, you can represent VM configuration in code, a Vagrant file that can be versioned. Um, I like it because I can provide Vagrant files for my projects, and so uh, you can you know, get on there and easily get an environment uh, that works for you, and it works with Linux, Windows, and OS X, and so it's a great way uh, for you to provide an environment for your projects. So if you have some project on GitHub, you might, uh, I would suggest also cr like setting up a, a Vagrant project as well so that people can easily, you know, hack on your code and not have to set up their own environments. Um, who here has ever wanted to like hack on some code and then there was like, so many crazy package dependencies and stuff and it only worked if you ran the very newest version of Ubuntu and all this and you're like, well, I'm just like never gonna help with that. Yeah. Um, I don't run the cutting edge Gen 2, Ubuntu, like whatever on my system. So like if that's what you require, like I, 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 I can't help. Um, Docker could help uh, for quickly running tests. Last year, I felt like my talk wouldn't be complete without a, uh, throwing a cloud on it, and I figured this year we'd, we'd sprinkle the blue whale in there a little bit. 
that seems to be the theme for Lisa, I've heard. All right, who's used uh, server spec before? Oh, wow, uh, a few folks here. So server spec is tool agnostic, and it uses the RSpec testing framework. Who's used RSpec before? Yep, so if you've uh, had to deal with Ruby, you've probably seen RSpec. Um, here's what the code actually looks like. Again, this is platforms uh, independent, and so I'm saying package HTTP, it should be installed. Here's a service, it should be running and set to, and set to start at boot time, and then port 80 should be listening, right? And so th this doesn't describe how that happens, Right, this, th th this is just the test for the outcome. So whether I did this manually or with configuration management or whatever, that's not the uh, goal here. It's just to test the final outcome. Um, you could write code like this and then run rake spec and hopefully get back <coughs> output that looks like this. So this is, uh, how many folks in here uh, don't know Ruby? Yeah, yeah. And so this just happens to be in Ruby, but like I think it's pretty easy to grok and understand. There's, there's not like crazy syntax in here. Um, and so even if you don't know Ruby, you could tackle something like this and not feel like you have to learn this whole new language. You could use this RSpec like DSL to you know, test your uh, code. Um, here we've got uh, the chef and Beaker uh, giving each other a hug here. So Puppet uh, has a, a uh, product called Beaker and Chef has a product called Test Kitchen. Uh, both of those provide functionality to provision VMs with Vagrant and then run functional tests over them. So if you're using one of those two tools, Chef or Puppet, highly recommend Beaker or Test Kitchen. Uh, you're gonna wanna look at those. Um, could folks read that? How about that? Um, so this is actual RSpec puppet code. Um, I don't know if this is actually visible to anyone that's not in the first road. Uh, but what it does is there's uh, RSpec add-ons for the two languages. Um, and what they test is the desired state of the system, or in uh, puppet terminology, the catalog. Uh, but they're testing the desired state of the system, not the system itself. And so the server spec code here is testing the actual system, whereas this code here is testing the desired state. Um, you want both, and why this is important is imagine you're writing um, code to support multiple operating systems, or uh, you know, you've got a lot of conditional logic in there. And so I can write this code to ensure that, you know, if it's on this platform, I actually get these resources with these values, and that shows up in the catalog. Um, it's also really fast to run the tests f for these, a lot faster than the functional testing where you have to provision VMs and do a more uh, thorough testing. Here is using something like RSpec Puppet or ChefSpec today. A uh, handful of folks, right on. Cool. Next is monitoring. Um, so as sysadmins, monitoring is, is how you're already testing production. Um, you wanna do this in pre-production as well. Who here runs the same monitoring that they do in prod in their non-prod environments? Yeah? Hopefully you send the alerts not to the same team or they will hate you. Uh, trust me, I did that. Um, so yeah, the, the folks in the knock are stressed enough. Don't send them like your alerts. Um, uh, like can anyone tell me what this test does? Like what do you think it does, Matt? Yeah, it tests the uh, ICMP response. So like if you sell things on the internet, not a great test. Um, I'm, uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot again, Matt. Like what do you think this does? Uh, 
yeah, it connects to a website. I'm checking to see if I get like a 200 response. Um, again, if you sell things on the internet, this response or this test also awful. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're testing the service from the point of view of the consumer. And so whether that's selling things online or providing an API uh, or any sort of service that you're actually testing it from the viewpoint of the consumer. Um, that you have a bunch of graphs on like CPU and memory usage and disk usage and all that for your systems might help you if there's some problem you have to like diagnose. That doesn't mean anything if you don't actually monitor that the people who use your service can actually use it, right? Um, by adding tests to your monitoring system, whenever you encounter an, uh, encounter an error, you create a positive feedback loop that improves testing. And so, let's say a process hangs and you log in to restart the service, you, your job isn't done until you've written a new test that could identify that in the future. And so anytime you have to manually touch anything on a system, so to, to fix something, you should be writing a test so you don't have to do that again, or you're at least alerted uh, about it in the future. Um, so to recap, we're gonna write tests, which are gonna fail at first. We're gonna write just enough code to pass, and then we're gonna refactor those tests as necessary. Um, left plenty of time here for Q&A. Uh, if folks have questions, I think you're supposed to step up to the microphone. Yeah. Or I can just repeat them. Yeah. Um, hi, excellent talk. Um, so I had a boff the other night on uh, test-driven uh, development for infrastructure code, and uh, at the end talked a lot about, you know, what we wish we had. Uh, one of the things that came up was um, uh, connecting monitoring to the tests that we're writing. Um, you know, if, if, if something dropped from the sky and it was the perfect framework for testing, it would spit out Nagios configs for what we're testing for so that we can, you know, where appropriate, say, we're, we're testing for this in our, you know, in our, when spinning up VMs for our puppet, um, for our puppet modules. Um, but now let's make a Nagios test that, you know, makes sure that we get a 200 back from the web server, something like this. Do you know of anything like that? I don't know of any tools that are gonna just map those things one to one for you, uh, but I think that you're on the right road in that um, your monitoring is how you test uh, uh, your production system. So you, you want that to be as comprehensive as, as it can, and, and you want it to be from the role of the consumer. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, just seeing that like, in your example that, you know, the web server is up, like that's not very, that's, that's not a very good test, right? Like we want to be service orientated. Right. Yeah. Um, it, if, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, if there's no other question, one other question we came up with was um, the idea of a testing framework not tied so much to one particular configuration management tool. Um, Puppet's got Beaker and that's great, but tomorrow I want to learn CF Engine and I don't want to rewrite yeah. all the, the, the I don't know why you do want to do that, but like uh, <laughs> A uh, thing to check out would be server spec. That was a tool that's uh, yeah. tool agnostic. And so you could write uh, the server spec tests and then it doesn't matter how the system got to that state, you're just testing that it is in the right state. Okay, fair enough. Uh, so like I would look at that, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, I've uh, flirted with test-driven development before. And one of the things, particularly with uh, when you're starting off something that serves a psychological barrier to me at least is that you cannot tinker with tests but you can tinker with code so when you're at the stage of trying to figure out what's possible and what's not possible um, uh, and to guide you in your design you, you're you don't know enough yet to write the tests that form the the design of your code well what are you building like to uh, me it says you don't know what what you're even trying to accomplish and so by writing the test first, that's where we document this is our goal and what we want to accomplish, and then we write the test first. Um, so like you shouldn't have to write any code to like figure out what the goal is. Okay, so you're saying essentially start off with a very high level test, which encompasses the end goal of the entire piece of software, or? Uh, 
Yeah, so you might start with like higher level tests and then work your way down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I Thanks. think I was probably starting off with trying to come up with tests that are too low level then. Uh, would be my so problem. like you want tests that are going to be testing like the functionality of the system, right? Like not necessarily, uh, yeah. The, yeah, the so tests those tests be. are going to fail for a long time. <laughs> Yeah, but it feels it feels really great when you write a bunch of tests and they're all red, and then you start writing code and they start yeah. going green again. Yeah. You get like lots of small wins, uh, and for me that's uh, really awesome because I get incremental uh, progress and incremental success, which which drives me to want to keep continuing, as opposed to this just huge does it work or not. Um, I'm able to get small wins, um, which helps me out. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Hi. Uh, why would it test the state of your system when you're already forcing the state using, using Puppet or something similar? You're like saying, hey, I want this service running, but Puppet is, Puppet is already forcing the service running. Why would you have both a spec and a configuration manager that you had in examples previously? So is the question, um, it feels like I'm writing the same thing twice? Kind of looks What it comes same. down to? Looks so, so, like, you might write uh, puppet code to manage um, Apache on your system, right? Um, but you'll want to have spec tests for that code because you want to be able to refactor that module at some point and know whether you're breaking things or not. And so that's that's what the spec tests are useful for. Um, you also want to have like functional tests to see, okay, I wrote valid puppet code and it makes this configuration, but does it actually like serve a web page? Um, and so you'll you'll want functional tests for that. Um, oftentimes, I'll write, I'll automate systems that like I don't even know how like how they work or like what they're supposed to do. So for me, it's like really critical to have those functional components um, like testable because like I don't even know what like your crazy internal application is. And so that's that's how I know that I've accomplished the goal because now the tests pass. So I guess the example you had was, I guess. A too simple to force the issue, I guess. Yeah, so like I like I actually start with writing code that looks like this and then going back and writing the, the config management code that's gonna like make that happen. Yeah, for example the ensure installed OpenSSH, you know, it's gonna install OpenSSH. You don't really I don't see why I would add extra test for that. Well I want to test that that's actually what's in the the desired state of the system. So like one line of this is it should contain an SSHD config and it should have this particular line permit root login, yes. And so I want to make sure that that's always there. And so I write the test for that and then they fail and then I might go write uh, something to make that happen. So like maybe at first I just like serve some file and it has that inside of it, but then I want to add conditional logic later so that I could have permit root yes or no, right? And so it enables me to refactor my code because now I can add conditional logic, I can make that a, a template, and I can see that that test still works. Yeah, it, exactly. So like Matt's saying like we need to basically the ability to document what's important to us. And for me, it's important that that one line is in the config file. And so uh, if somebody refactors that file and turns it into a template or changes it around, they can do like whatever, but that line has to still be there or I'm going to see that things failed and I'm not going to accept it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think we've got another minute if anyone has uh, like any other questions. Uh, the question was, do I have this code as for what my site should be doing or with the individual modules? And so 
this, this type of code, this is our spec puppet code, uh, the same stuff if you're using like chef spec, you would keep it with the individual module because I'm, I'm, I'm just testing that that code produces a desired state. Well, I'm saying by default, that's what I want. And then I would have another test potentially where uh, I say, well, like, let's say I've got this code, like down the road, I might want to make that variable. So it could be like, yes or no. So I'd have a piece of conditional logic. And then I would have a test that checked, oh, if I want that, make sure it's there. Or if I don't, you know, make sure it's like, yes or no. And so that's, that's when you start expanding upon your tests. Um, but that might be like a code refactor. So the code might look like this, but then you want to add that functionality when well, you're going to add the test for it as well. Um, and hopefully you wrote it first and then you went and like hacked on the code. Uh, not, well, it depends how you deployed it. So like this kind of code, um, you could actually deploy with each of your modules or you could do it as more you know, this is what my site should look like for a given role. And that's sort of uh, up to you how you do it, organize that. Right on. All right, like, thanks, everybody. I really appreciate it.